a little dust storm around its feet. Yes, Mama, Essie says, you can see he gentle. Well, I looked at Essie and then at that horse because I didn't think we could be looking at the same animal. 250. I should have figured how Essie's eyes ain't never been so good. Come on, Mama, GL says. All right, I says. So I stood on the porch and watched GL hitching that horse up to the white folks' buggy. For a while there, the animal was pretty quiet, pawing a little, but not much. And I was feeling a little better about riding with GL behind that crazy looking horse. I could see how GL was happy I was going with him. He was scurrying around that animal, buckling buckles and strapping straps all the time smiling, and that made me feel good. Then he was finished, and I must say, that horse looked mighty fine hitched to that buggy, and I knew anybody what climbed up there would look pretty good, too. G.L. came around and stood at the bottom of the steps and took off his hat and bowed and said, Madam, and reached out his hand to me, and I was feeling real elegant, like a fine lady. He helped me up to the seat and then got up beside me, and we moved out down our alley. And I remember how colored folks come out on their porches and shook their heads saying, Lord, now will you look at Eva Dunford, the fine lady? Don't she look good sitting up there? And I pretended not to hear and sat up straight and proud. We rode on through the center of town, up Market Street, and all the way out where Hiram is living now, which in them days was all woods. There not even being a farm in sight, and that's when that horse must have first realized he weren't at all broke or tame or maybe thought he was back out west again and started the gallop. GL, I says, now you ain't joking with your mama, is you? Because if you is, I'll strap you purple if I live through this. Well, GL was pulling on the reins with all his meager strength and yelling, Whoa, you! Say now, whoa! He turned to me just long enough to say, I ain't fooling with you, mama, honest. I reckon that animal weren't too satisfied with the road because it made a sharp right turn just then down into a gully and struck out across a hilly meadow. Mama, GL yells, Mama, do something. I didn't know what to do, but I figured I had to do something, so I stood up, hopped down onto the horse's back, and pulled it to a stop. Don't ask me how I did that. I reckon it was that I was a mother and my baby asked me to do something, is all. Well, we walked that animal all the way home. Sometimes I had to club it over the nose with my fist to make it come, but we made it. GL and me. You remember how tired we was, Charles? Now, let's pause for a moment. This is a, we, we see this often. Uh, a classic example of this is the great writer Joseph Conrad, who loves to have a story within a story. So notice we've got the story of Chick coming back down, you know, to Tennessee for the first time to meet his grandma, who he doesn't know at all. And clearly he can get a sense. There's some negative energy between his daddy and his grandma. That is clear. They're sitting at the table. They're eating you know, having a good time laughing. And then all of a sudden there's this story that mom is going to tell about this brother in the family of, of his uncle, GL, who was kind of maybe like a little bit more of a troublemaker, uh, um, you know, a little bit, a little bit uh, you know, more like rebellious. And this story about the horse. And so what do we learn in the story about the horse? Write it down about grandma. What do we learn in that story? Notice her son says, don't worry, I've got all this under control. Once the horse goes out of control, notice GL will turn to Mama. Mama will jump out of the carriage onto the back of the horse, slow the horse down, halt the horse, they walk the horse back, and if the horse gives any kind of attitude, she whacks it across the nose, which tells you something about Mother and her ability to control, maybe we would even say dominate, Notice the story ends on page 250 with her saying, you remember how tired we was, Charles? She'll turn to Charles, who of course in the story is not mentioned at all, right? By the way, do note that in the story we get our one mention of Charles's father, right? That is to say, the man's already passed away, and now Mama, Grandma, is living alone, and yet clearly still a fierce woman to be reckoned with, no doubt about it. The characterization that we're developing is central to our reading of this story, obviously. Let's listen to how Charles responds. I uh, wasn't here at the time. Chick turned to his father and found his face completely blank, without even a trace of a smile or a laugh. 251. 
Well, of course you was, son. That happened in, in, it was a hot summer that year, and I left here in June of that year. You wrote me about it. The old lady stared past Chig at him. They all turned to him. Uncle Hiram looked up from his plate. Then you don't remember how we all laughed. No, I don't, Mama, and I probably wouldn't have laughed. I don't think it was funny. They were staring into each other's eyes. Why not, Charles? Because in the first place, the horse was gained by fraud. And in the second place, both of you might have been seriously injured or even killed. He broke off their stare and spoke to himself more than to any of them. And if I'd done it, you would have beaten me good for it. Pardon? The old lady had not heard him. Only Chig had heard. Chig's father sat up straight as if preparing to debate. I said that if I had done it, if I had done just exactly what GL did, you would have beaten me good for it, Mama. He was looking at her again. All right, let's pause for a moment. You can obviously interpret now a little bit more of what's going on, right? Great storytellers do this, where they reveal through the story something's going on. And already at 3B, some of you are starting to put this thing together from personal experience. Being in a situation where you have two brothers or two siblings, and one gets treated one way, and another gets treated another way. We call this sibling rivalry. Write that down. Sibling rivalry, fighting, struggle. Notice that uh, that Chig's dad, Charles, says, you know what, I wasn't here. Can't, you, you can't even remember that I wasn't here. I had already left. And you wrote me about it. But no, I, I wouldn't have laughed if it had happened. And here's why. The pony was gained by fraud. In other words, my brother is, is, is uh, not, a, is not a, a very honest person, Charles is suggesting. And then secondly, and you can tell this is the more stinging point. He says, if that's something I had done, I'd have gotten seriously beat for it. Instead, with GL, it was considered kind of funny and ha, ha, ha. In other words, what's he really saying to his mother? To Chig's grandmother, he's saying, all my life, you loved, right, GL more than you loved me. I was treated differently. I was treated unfairly in some ways. Of course, now we're going to get to the real tension of the text. So here we go in our visit to grandmothers. Let's watch this. Why you say that, son? She was leaning toward him. Don't you know? Tell the truth, it can't hurt me now. His voice cracked, but only once. If GL and I did something wrong, you'd beat me first and then be too tired to beat him. At dinner, he'd always get seconds and I wouldn't. You'd do things with him, like ride in that buggy, but if I wanted you to do something with me, you were always too busy. He paused and considered whether to say what he finally did say. I cried when I left here. Nobody loved me, Mama. There I it cried is. all the way up to Knoxville. That was the last time I ever cried in my life. Oh, Charles. She started to get up to come around the table to him. He stopped her. It's too late. But you don't understand. What well, don't I understand? I understood then. I understand now. Tears now traveled down the lines in her face. But when she spoke, her voice was clear. I thought you knew. I had ten children. I had to give all of them what they needed most. She nodded. I paid more mind to GL. I had to. GL could have ended up swinging if I hadn't. But you was smarter. You was more grown up than GL when you was five and he was ten. And I tried to show you that by letting you do what you wanted to do. That's not true, Mama. You know it. G.L. was light-skinned and had good hair and looked almost white, and you loved him for that. Charles, no, no, son, I didn't love any one of you more than any other. That can't be true. His father was standing now, his fists clenched tight. Admit it, Mama. Please. Chig looked at him, shocked. The man was actually crying. It may not have been right what I'd done, but I ain't no liar. 
Chick knew she did not really understand what had happened, what he wanted of her. I'm not lying to you, Charles. Chick's father had gone pale. He spoke very softly. You're about 30 years too late, Mama. He bolted from the table. Silverware and dishes rang and jumped. Chick heard him hurrying up to their room. They sat in silence for a while and then heard a key in the front door. A man with a new lacquered straw hat came in. He was wearing brown and white two-toned shoes with very pointed toes and a white summer suit. Say now, man, I heard my brother was in town. Where he at? Where that rascal? He stood in the doorway, smiling broadly, an engaging, open, friendly smile, the innocent smile of a five-year-old. Now, some have called this the Cain and Abel motif. You can write that down if you want. That is to say the rivalry between two brothers. If you know the ancient story from the biblical text, you have the story of Cain and Abel, where they kind of don't get on and one ends up hurt, um, killing the other and that kind of thing. This idea of struggle between the two. You've got then really, interestingly, you've got four major characters in the story. Let's list them really fast. One, obviously, is Chig, the 17-year-old boy that's clearly not got a complete understanding of his family. And there he is all of a sudden down with his grandma for the first time that he recognizes her and he's learning about the family. Number two, you've got Chig's daddy who has decided to come back for a reunion and to have this exchange with his mother. He has not seen his mother for quite some time and Chig is studying closely the way that his father and his grandma get on. Number three, you've got this woman who is the grandmother. She raised ten children. And she has been called out by one of those children sitting around the table. And Charles will say, you loved my brother more than you loved me. He was the bad boy and you liked him better, you loved him better. Did you notice there's also some racism going on here? He looked less black than me, and that's why you liked him more. Mama's, of course, response is, what are you talking about? I gave to my children what they needed. GL would have been swinging. What does that mean? He would have been arrested and hung if I hadn't taken more care of him. He needed things I had to give to him. She says to, to Charles, you on the other hand, you are smarter. You are more independent. I stayed out of the way. I let you do your thing. In other words, there was no favoritism played at all. None. The fourth character in the story is the one that's never in the story until the very end, and of course it's Gio. It's the character who we know inevitably without ever meeting him. He's the one who always is in trouble. He's the one that's always irresponsible. He's the one that always is having to have somebody bail him out. And the more responsible brother, clearly Charles, has resented it all his life, carrying this stuff deep deep. How do we know that it's deep? Well, Chig's amazed because all of a sudden his daddy starts crying. It's clear that the adult is really emotionally tied to this experience of way, way, way back in the past. Well, let's jump to 3A. What is, the, what is a potential message or theme here? Well, there's several. Let's maybe list several of them. Uh, one, this is obviously a text about family and the ways that family will construct all of these challenges, both for parents as well as for children. The idea as well of favoritism. Number two, you carry stuff with you a long time because of family, this story suggests. And at odd moments, it finds its way out in an emotional outburst. Chig thought he knew his dad, but there's a whole part of his dad's personality. He didn't know it all. And now all of a sudden, Chig's kind of standing there watching this going, oh, you can probably imagine the light bulbs start coming on like, oh, yes, okay, very, very interesting. I got it, I got it, I got it. Finally, number three, it's hard to be a parent. It's hard to be a child. And very often, the two 
live or cohabitate together, but don't really understand the other side. It's pretty obvious that Mama has forgotten probably the ways that she showed favoritism to GL and not towards Charles. But now, after time, Mama looks at Charles and says, clearly you've gone on to become very, very successful, right? GL, on the other hand, GL is still, you know, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the same kid that he was. He's just grown into an adult body. Let's talk really quickly about to be in the genius of characterization here. How does this story develop those characters? Well, who for you is the character with whom you most identify? This is an interesting question. It's a 3B question, but we'll ask it now. Who do you most identify with in this story? Do you identify with the 17-year-old kid who's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, like, what's going on in the history of our family? All of a sudden, I'm beginning to realize why my father is the way he is. I'm beginning to realize why I've never been to, gra to meet Grandma ever before in my life. Right. Do you identify with Charles, who has been treated a certain way in his youth, and he's carried it with it all his life. He's carried it with him. And he's clearly still deeply wounded by this. Do you identify with mama who's being accused of something and she's like what are you talking about I try to be a good mom to, I had 10 kids for crying out loud I mean are you serious with me right now you should have let stuff go long ago I should have I should have been forgiven for whatever it was I was doing do you identify with GL that is to say the one in the family I've had, I, I once had a sophomore that said, I totally understand GL because I'm that one in the family. It's true. I can do anything and get away with it because I am the youngest. And I get away with everything. But my older, my older sister, she gets so mad because she, it's so hard on her. And I get away with everything. It's not fair. And when, I, and, and, and when my sister calls me out on it or my mom out on it, so I can, I can identify with GL. Let's jump to 3A really quickly. Do you remember those, those lines from our very beginning in our freshman year of study? Uh, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Do you remember that line? The child is father of the man, and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. That notion that as children, we become the adults that we become, right? We carry, however, with us all this stuff. What is the text for you? about family that most quickly comes to mind. What is the text for you? Maybe it's a film, maybe it's a, maybe it's a song that has to do with the issues of family, the challenges of family, the ways in which we can be hurt or wounded within our family and by our upbringing. Maybe in ways parents don't understand at all. Let's jump to 3B. To what degree is it possible that children are wounded in their families but they don't understand how they're wounded always until later in their life. And what they want is some sense of closure with their parents, right? But they don't know how to get it, and so all they can do is just get emotional and make a, and make a charge. You, mom, you. Of course, the mother's like, what are you talking about? That was a long time ago. Clearly, mother's moved on. Son has not moved on. Son, kind of stuck. How do you forgive a parent? that has in some ways hurt or wounded you. Is Charles in the right to carry this level of rage? Or should he long ago have let it go? And why couldn't he let it go? Why has it continued to bother him? Charles is clearly a successful man now. Why does he continue to carry this stuff? Why can't he just, quote unquote, let it go? Finally, what about sibling rivalry? If you live in a family with a brother or a sister, is it possible for parents to raise children without being playing favorites? Like, for example, if you have a brother or a sister and you recognize there's favoritism that's played, one morning did your mom wake up and go, my favorite, not my favorite. Is that how it worked? We have a tendency to think probably not. So then how does it happen? How does that happen that one in the family gets treated a certain way and another in the family gets treated a different way? Hmm. Well, this wonderful story, A Visit to Grandmother, resurrects all kinds of challenges for us. I hope you enjoyed, I hope you enjoyed the study. Thank you.